Okay, so on screen here, we've got um, Adrian Keane and we've got Lapo Diefenbrook here as well. Sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm Leah, I'm the Southwest Knowledge Exchange Manager for Beef and Lamb for AHDB. So Adrian, you're our 2019 Strategic Farmer. So let's start with a bit of an introduction for the audience. Do you want to talk through this slide? Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Adrian Keane, I've farmed at Path Farm, Callington in Cornwall. We're as you see on the screen, a very mixed farm um, with sort of cereals, potatoes, cattle and, and sheep. I mean, the sheep are on the next page in a minute. Um, we use the cereals to feed the cattle and the sheep and also as a in and out of grass to, for reseeding. Um, and I mean, cattle numbers or cattle are all bought in as sterks off dairy farms, probably anywhere between three months and above. Yeah, three months old and above, and taking through to finish. Um, on to the next page, Leah. Uh, with the sheep, we're all North Country mules from a single source in Skipton. Rams, we use a real mixture of rams, but we're part of the AHDB Ram Compare project. So they put um, fresh rams on the farm every year. So um, this year we've had two South Downs, two Meat Links, and two Charolais turn up. They're all, all the uh, main flock is single sire mated in this year in groups of 50. And we also sponged 150 ewes to try and land them the first week of the lambing period to get them out of the shed to keep costs down and make um, management of the shed easier. Uh, all the lambs go to Dunbeer in Wales. Uh, that, that again is to do with uh, the round compare project. All the lambs are, um, there's a lot of data collected while they're alive on farm and also at the abattoir. And the data is then fed into new EBVs they're creating. Uh, we also have other sort of diversifications. We sell a lot of Christmas trees in December. We've also got a biomass boiler and a farm shop, and we've got a couple of small um, domestic PV systems. Brilliant. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, so as part of uh, the strategic farm project, um, when Adrian applied, he um, identified a few areas in which he would like to improve on the farm. Um, one of those being grass and quality, which is why we're bringing you today's webinar on improving your grass health uh, by understanding uh, your grass growth by understanding soil health. So. That's what we're going to focus on today. So, Adrian, do you want to just give us a background of why why that was an objective for you? Um, what's your grassland been like in in the past? Uh, there's a lot of grass that's been down for probably 40 years plus, and uh, I mean, Lapa will probably tell you this is full of various grasses that aren't as sort of beneficial to the animals as they could be. Um, a lot of I think creeping bent in there and things like that. And I wanted to look at trying to, well, firstly identifying which fields aren't growing very much grass, and then going on forward and spending money on those to try and, you know, improve the actual grass quality and get more production out of them. And how are you currently grazing your grassland? Um, every, well, pretty much all the stock is rotationally grazed. Uh, partly through the project, this pushed me to rotationally graze the cattle as well. I've been mean, probably for the last seven or eight years. We rotation grazes the lambs after weaning. Uh, we wean onto the silage aftermath. Um, and then two years ago, we started rotation grazing the ewes as well. And it's always been a case of, especially with cattle, it's having the infrastructure in place, water frost, fences. Uh, this sort of been, so the best way to describe it is only ranched in areas, you know, having three or four fields, they just run the whole lot because there's only one water source in that area. So we've worked hard this spring and split blocks up, water troughs, fences in. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're starting to make progress. Okay, um, in maybe five, ten years time, what, where would you like to see your grassland? What, would, what sort of quality are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for a lot more rye grass, a lot more clover in that. Um, I think mainly white because of ease of management for us. Um, we are sort of thinking about uh, herbal lays, but it's how they fit in with us grazing over winter and you know 
And I mean, I don't think within the, the silage ground they'd be ideal because of the quality and, but I mean, I might be wrong on that. But it's this case of, you know, to continue to get the farm set up to rotation graze better and well, yeah, try and improve the, the species. Brilliant, okay. Um, so it's probably worth saying as well, my colleague Nerith Wright is on the phone or on the line today as well. She's going to help us with our tech support and read out your questions. So please do send your questions in. Have you got some already, Nerith? Um, no, not at the moment. Nothing relating to anything technical, just a few. Um, oh, hang on. We've got just got one come in. How do you manage rotational grazing with so many single sire tupping groups? Oh, that's a good one. That is my issue in this time of year. I mean, in a perfect world, I'd be able to split up small fields infinitely to rotation graze them. I mean, at the moment, I'm usually basically keeping them in one field for seven days and moving them to the next one for another and then moving them back again. So it's not ideal, but it's, it comes down to infrastructure again and it's, it's one of the headaches I do get this time of year. Uh, to sort of offset that slightly, I do sort of feed a few oats this time of year just to keep the, the sheep you know, in good condition and cycling and hopefully, you know, flushing well. Anything else, Neris? No, that's it for now. Thank you. No, OK, so please, please do ask your questions throughout um, and Neris can pop up and ask our speakers there. Um, so. I think this is an appropriate time to bring you in, Lupo. Um, so if you could just bring yourself off mute. Lupo Deepenbrook is an independent grassland consultant and has been working with Adrian um, for the last year and will continue to do, do so for, for the next three years of the project. Um, so Neris, if you could change uh, the presenter from, from me to Lupo um, and maybe then we'll stick up the poll and just see, see what our audience are doing in terms of their grassland. Yeah, OK, so um, we've got a, a poll that's going to come up on the screen, guys, when I just press launch and you'll have one of five options to choose from. Um, and the question is to help us learn where you are, where you are at with your understanding of grass growth and soil health, select which apply. So I'm going to launch that now. Hopefully that is working for everybody. So I will give it, let me check what time it is now. We'll give it up to a minute at most. So we've got, um, hang on, I can't see the options. Hang on. I really wasn't the best person to put in charge of technology. Um, <laughs> the subjects are new to me and I have a lot to learn. I understand the three leaf theory. I dig holes regularly across the farm to assess soil health. I measure and monitor grass growth throughout the season or the grazing system. I take soil samples and manage grassland according to results. So you can select more than one of those if you would like. And we've got, yeah, people are um, voting. So we've had over half of you vote already. Excellent. So we, I think I'd say based on the results, we've got a real good split. So 50% are saying the subjects are new to me and have a lot to learn. And then we've got literally another 50% taking, I take soil samples and manage according to results. So I'd say we've got quite a split audience today, guys. Okay, a few more seconds. Okay, that's been a whole minute. So I'll close it if that's all right with everybody. Thank you. And. Oh, interesting. Oh. Have you, can you see, oh, here we go. Can you see them? Yep, so 43% have selected subjects are new to them and they've got lots to learn. 43% understand the three leaf theory. 14% dig holes regularly across the farm to assess soil health. 37% measure and monitor grass growth through the grazing system. And 49% take soil samples and manage grassland according to the results. So it's very interesting. Hopefully that will help you, Lapo. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Are we able to close that? Yeah, that's closed. Excellent. Okay. Over to you, Lapo. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's actually real good to, yeah, that's better because I've got the screen overlying my screen, if you see what I mean. Um, 
it's actually good to go onto Adrian's farm and have a look around soil health. It's actually with COVID, we've had limited meetings. Those meetings we would normally carry out with the HDB with a group of farmers walking through the field and digging holes. Uh, but this is more a virtual exercise, even though I've done some of the work uh, in the myself and some interesting points come up. And uh, what I'd like to discuss with you is basically firstly do the sort of looking at grass, how it grows and explain to people, you know, the grass growth curve um, and also the annual production of grass, how, why it changes relating to temperature and moisture. And then I try and relate that later on to the soil health. Uh, we'll be looking at um, you know, soils, water holding capacity, earthworms, etc. And then in, to summarize it, um, you know, going forward, taking all that into account, how to graze effectively and uh, efficiently, and also for your benefits as well, trying to include a bit more up-to-date research information on rotational grazing, which I managed to obtain. So hopefully that will answer a lot of uh, the sort of 50% of people that are not quite up to speed with it. Hopefully it will answer a lot of their queries, if not answering the questions towards the end. So um, where we are then, if I can. So just the fundamentals of grass growth, you can actually find this in the AHB Knowledge Library, which is under the heading of Understanding Grass Growth for Beef Rotational Grazing. And this is actually ryegrass. Uh, other grasses do not uh, perform the, a, a similar function. But once you cut off grass, you know when you mow your lawn, the grass is a bit yellow. And then all of a sudden you get this sort of green haze where the first leaf emerges. Most of that first leaf will emerge from the reserve used uh, of sugars, etc., in the roots. Um, because that's actually trying to extend out the solar panel in order to start gathering sunlight. It's not really until we get to the second leaf stage that we're nearly back into rebuilding the reserves. Uh, the, not the second leaf stage, we're actually starting accumulating sugars again. That's going back in the roots for next time round. And so the optimum grass production is really at the three, two and a half to three leaf stage, which is like the green shaded area that you can see on the graph. Okay. Once you get beyond this three leaf stage, when the fourth leaf sort of grows up through the middle, you find that the first leaf will die off, okay, because it's basically, you know, it's the plant's sort of shading that leaf out and it's done its time, it's done its job and it will die off. Get the fifth leaf stage on there, you find that the you know, second leaf will die off. So the optimum stage and the optimum digestibility, because dead leaves are not very digestible, uh, uh, is actually at the three leaf stage. And I was going to show a slide to show exactly uh, on you know, how much grass is really growing per day, one leaf stage versus two leaf versus three leaf stage. But just roughly speaking, if we're looking at optimum grass growing conditions with a three leaf stage growing 120 kilos per hectare per day, when grass is at two leaf stage, it only grows at about 80. And if it's only at the one leaf stage, it only grows around about 40. So you can see going towards the three leaf stage is really beneficial for growth rates in your pasture. Uh, so going back to what Adrian's doing with the lambs at the moment, and he did say it's a sort of suboptimal uh, way of, you know, sort of seven days on, on one paddock, letting it sort of slightly green up again and then putting the sheet back on. You know, he's not optimizing his growth rates, which we're well aware of. But but it's uh, something that we'll have to set up with all the groups that we have and lack of infrastructure. Now, interesting ones is that you can access this as well for, in Forage for Knowledge, which gets sent out to you by email uh, if you subscribe to it. Uh, this is uh, the last three years of grass growth. A lot of you will identify with the blue line, which is 2018, where we had a drought going towards the end of the year. And a lot of you will identify as well with the uh, uh, orange line, which is uh, an early season drought, as earliest I've known it, uh, starting around May 2020 this year. And um, but you know we've, we've, that line now will follow. You know we had a big a bit of peak. A lot of us had rain at the end of June, uh, definitely in the west country. I know in the east eastern part of the country we haven't had that rain, uh, but definitely after a bit of rain, so of end of August we've had a, quite a lot of grass growth again. Now going to September. Uh, on from that actually into October. We can all remember one day when it was really hot in September and then coming to October, we got really, really cold. And if you look at soil temperatures, uh, soil temperatures now are running around about the sort of nine to 10 degrees. 
uh, grass actually starts growing at about six and there's usually a response on grass growth for every one degree increase in soil temperature grass growth will grow an extra 10 to 20 uh, 15 kilos dry matter a day so grass growth this time of the year is usually limited by uh, temperature and in the spring it's limited by temperature come mid season it's limited by moisture uh, and yeah it'd be nice to sort of have that green light every year but unfortunately it doesn't seem to happen Right, what can we do to improve grass growth? Um, there's a whole lot that you know shown here. Uh, I really want to, uh, most that Adrian does, there's, there's a bit on the top here, uh, grass and animal growth rates, you know, if it's below expectations, what you look at, you're looking at here, the top sort of gray box, it says access soil health, if you've got compaction, remedy compaction. If there's no compaction, they then go in and test for nutrients so you test the soils and we have a look at Adrian's a bit later on because it shows that Adrian's farm is really really fertile uh, all those indexes are on par I think on the pH there's only one below and only a couple of uh, potash is below but mainly they're on par if not above the index that's required <laughs> assess the weed level um, Adrian's fields they're relatively Adrian might say not, but relatively weak free because here it says docks more than 10 in five by seven square meter area uh, and haven't seen that many docks in Adrian's. Uh, but where Adrian suffers is down the bottom here, and I'll bring it up on the next, next screen to highlight it a bit more. Is he's actually looking at grass plants, and Adrian already referred to it. it. He has a lot of creeping bend Yorkshire fog and also lacking clover but it says here productive grasses should be above 70 percent when we talk about productive grasses they we tend to go for uh perennial rye grasses or italian rye grasses but perennial rye grasses in the grazing scenario um i would estimate uh adrian's across the farm because you have some reseeds as well we're probably running at about 70 percent but bearing in mind the reseeds are really nearly 100 percent rye grass uh so the rest of the farm must be you know a lot lower than that uh white clover we are reseeding with white clover uh but unfortunately in some of the fields and there's a slide coming up later of adrian's field there's not a lot of white clover in there um and um you know white clover definitely will help to increase uh soil fertility and production and also when the production grasses drop below 50 percent have a look at soil fertility and graze and grazing system and if the ultimate is consider reseeding. Can I just jump in there very quickly? The, the slide previous to this current one was quite difficult to see on the screen, especially if someone's perhaps on their iPhone. Um, so that is available in our Improving Pastures for Better Returns manual that is on the website. And I believe it, we at the end of this call, you will get sent um an email with a list of references in there and i believe that will be on there but if not just pop that into a search engine that was all sorry i just thought i'd point that out yeah thank you very much for that it's it's it, it's you know to me the screen my screen's about two foot wide and about 18 inches high so i can see it all but if you're on an iphone i can see that you just it's, this one is another classic case where you can't see nothing which is great because i'll just describe it to you this is adrian's grass measurements and all the fields that he has uh, is showing the wedge that we're actually up to nearly four ton of dry matter on the left hand side and we're down to uh, around about 17 1800 on the right hand side uh, we've got plenty of grass there that blue line is actually the demand line of his stock uh, at the time actually this was done on the 29th of august you know we had quite a surplus at the time and uh, i did say to adrian you know we'll we'll take some surplus off because once we got beyond that sort of 3500 the grass is suboptimum there'd be some dead leaf in there so much better to have it cut off rather than grazing to reset everything so that's what we're doing by measurements of grass um that's my grass bit sorted out now we're coming on to soil health uh, is there anything that adrian wants to discuss on reseeding Leah, um, or I did plan to reseed some of the, um, well, yeah, so I just drill some permanent pasture this year, but I contacted a local contractor and he said, oh yeah, got a perfect machine, came in, wouldn't look at the thatch at all, 
but he said, oh, I'll get someone else to come and do it. And he didn't turn up for a month. And I deemed it, you know, with Lapo's um, sort of knowledge as well, he's deemed it too late to actually do. So we miss that opportunity this year. But next year is, um, you know, I'm plan- I've got the CD already. So it's a case of I'm, I'm planning to do it. And I'll probably do end up doing more next year than I'm to make up for this year. What about reseeding Adrian with um, uh, no clover in the sward? Oh, you broke up then. What was that? The, the reseeding, you know, when, when you will carry out reseeding next year to the sward, and how do you manage that? You broke up just the wrong point again. He was asking <laughs> I said, about how it... the sward. Sorry? He was asking about clover within the sward. Are you planning to reseed with clover? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, everything we reseed has, uh, you know, a good, good mix of uh, at least two species of white clover. Um, we definitely see the benefit from that on, you know, with the, well, on the silage ground, definitely with the quality of the silage, and with the lambs when we're rotating, grazing the aftermath from silage, we, you know, they do very well on there. And it's a case of trying to have enough areas of clover to make sure their their diet's consistent. So it's you know, constantly trying to make sure I've got enough silage area that's got plenty of clover in to keep their diet consistent so they continue to keep growing. Lepo, for the benefit of those that are um, just getting started with their grass growth knowledge and, and learning those fundamentals, the graph you've got on screen now, can you tell us a little bit about that? How would you how would you collect the data for that graph and how would you put it into a graph? Um, not everyone will be familiar with agrinet. Sorry, okay, um, I was the... going to speak earlier. Sorry, but there was a question. There's a couple of questions about white clover. And do you mind if we just go back to that before we move on? Sorry, I tried to say it, but I was on mute. Apologies. Um, someone just asked why white clover? You did mention for ease of management, I think, Adrian. But can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Is there a particular reason why you choose white over over red? I uh, certainly with the red. Um... There is, it can be um, issues with fertility with sheep. So, I mean, it's something that, it's in the back of my mind that white means I can put the sheep wherever I want to. You know, if there is, I mean, at the moment I've got one typing group in a, a size field that would normally be used for the lambs because the lamb numbers are we've sold well through the summer. So, use that area. So, if it was red clover, all of a sudden I'll be thinking I can't really use that field. So, yeah. that, that's my main. <laughs> thinking behind it. Okay, so just that you've got clover that you can utilize anytime you like without having to worry about that six weeks either side of tupping. Yeah, yeah. okay, brilliant. Are we all right to do a couple of other questions before we move on or are we, yeah. Um, so somebody was asking about, um, are only rye grasses classed as productive? What about Cat- Coxfoot or Timothy? I think that's almost, a is that for you, Lepo? Okay, uh, cox, yeah, uh, coxfoot are very productive, especially in the dry situation. Now, we have to bear in mind, as Adrian's farm is in the Tamar Valley, in uh, alongside Bodmin um, Moor, it's relatively high rainfall. Um, probably, if I had a production graph of Adrian throughout the year, it would probably more mirror the 2019 curve, my growth curve, than it would be the uh, 2020 or 2018 growth curve showing that grass didn't grow. Uh, so, uh, Cox, and, and one thing with Coxfoot is not that palatable. Uh, so, if you've got good grass growth around the Coxfoot, what would tend to happen is that the grasses around Coxfoot will be eating, but the Coxfoot will not. But if you run into a drought scenario, which means the only grass you have is Coxfoot, cows rather have Coxfoot than nothing at all. So, that's really where Coxfoot is actually helpful. Uh, Timothy is a nice grass. It's a midsummer grass, so it grows well in midsummer, but the Problem again with, with Timothy is the productivity itself throughout the year. Uh, it runs at you know a, a slightly reduced growth rates with the same fertilizer compared to rye grass, and that's why we're sort of taking rye grass as being the benchmark for as a productive grass. Okay, and just on top of that, someone also asked the next question: Are chicory and plantain considered to be in a group of productive grasses? Uh, ch- chicory and plantain, they work well as in a, what we call it, they're herbs or forbs. It's part, it can make a part of a herbal lay. Uh, so 
the, within the herbal lay, they produce, they they will be very productive, but they're not actually in the same sort of category as uh, uh, as grasses they are. But having said that, in the herbal lay, they do perform very well. But it, they're again, they're in a the lay, so they're very short lived. Okay, and then there's just another one about overseeding. Is it too late to overseed now? <clears throat> Simple answer, yes. Right. Okay. Fine. Right. I'll I'll save some of the others so that you can move on. Uh, do you want me to discuss this graph, Leah? Didn't you? Um, yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. This this information is actually gathered from uh, walking each paddock with a plate meter. Uh, there are some remote sensing. Uh, companies out there that uh, will actually do it for you but a lot of that information will have to be calibrated to your particular farm uh, so um, and, and also sometimes a satellite can't see through cloud to find out what's there so currently we've still stuck with the, and also if you want to without a plate meter you can actually take grass samples in the field and weigh them uh, so this data is from each individual field on the grass walk that it, uh, Lynn did or I can't remember Adrian or Lynn on the 29th of August uh, to give a, a, a yield of each field of grass that's then put into AgriNet to provide that graph. Okay, so uh, I'll then go on to soils. Yeah, okay. The width uh, of the bar is um, the size of the field locker, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the width of the bar. So on this one, uh, field number 30 and 18, uh, sorry, 12 and no, number 30 is right at the end there. No, that one is, is a larger field than the one next to it, which is the green bar. Which is probably half the size of it. so yeah so so you can have really big fields on, on some grass but Adrian's fields are you know not too bad really field sizes wise and there's a lot of them which makes it really helpful for rotational grazing. Uh, soils I, I took this picture actually because I go out on a lot of farms and then, and actually I should have included another tractor you know beyond that now which is actually one without a cab you know to, totally autonomous tractor you know we keep removing ourselves further and further from the soil. And it's actually really helpful to go in and you know get your spade out and each tractor as apart from a grease gun should be fitted with a spade attached to it so you can actually take it out and dig a hole in places uh, if not put a spade in each gateway or take it with you when you walk the fields uh, you can actually find some a lot of, there's a lot of uh, details on soil and soil quality uh, on each farm this one is actually from um, uh, the Nandis website called soil and Adrian's farm actually straddles two particular soil types. One is soilscape six, which is free draining, slightly acidic soil. That is actually the hatched area on the left hand side. And if you go into the uh, other one, which is on the right hand side, you know, the hatched area is actually soilscape series seven, which is probably if Adrian, you know, because he grows arable crops as well, that's mainly the, the fields where Adrian would grow up as arable crops because it's a bit more fertile than the. Uh, the ones on the on the on the left. Uh, when I said earlier, Adrian's done soil tests. Uh, this is actually all the soil tests that we've done at the beginning of the uh, strategic farm project. And if you look at it, all the green squares actually show it's really really fertile. And for those of you that are up to date with pHs on grasslands, you know as long as we have a pH of six to six and a half, we're okay. There's only one there that's pH of five point seven but the highest has a pH of seven, so well in abundance. Uh, the orange boxes or yellow, they're actually showing fields that are well above on P and K indexes, uh, and there's more orange boxes than that, and there are blue boxes which show we're slightly below. But as overall, the, like I said before, the farm is in good fertile, in a fertile state, so that's not going to limit grass growth. Okay, so this is a view. Uh, unfortunately, sorry about my shadow there, but this is a view of Adrian's land uh, down the very bottom. As we go down, there's actually the River Tamar, but the uh, you can see there the sheep on the top of the hill, uh, and the far just beyond that sheep, you might see a couple of fencing posts as well. There's a temporary fence up there. This is the field that Adrian goes in and grazes for seven days, and then they go on the other side of the fence and graze that for seven days. Uh, the soils that you see here, it's you know if you do a soil assessment on that, but it's actually you know very good soil soils, very crumbly. It would be scoring one to two on the VES uh, score. Uh, if you look at my spade, actually, the interesting one there, it actually the soil sticking to it. Aidan asked me if it was the right time 
uh, to actually go in and, and slot the fields because this, the, the, the soil is sticking to my spade and it's actually smearing a bit. I said to Adrian, no, it's not a good time to actually uh, do the field. But there's another reason why, and I come up with that in a minute, why I said to Adrian, don't do anything slitting or so in the field. Uh, that's my spade again and the soil a bit closer. Uh, for you, those of you that are sort of well aware of it, digging holes on the right hand side of the screen there, that bit of thing sticking up there, that root sticking up what is a dock root. That we got the odd one or two off. Um, but what I found in this particular field where the sheep were, we had a when I dug down, I could feel that was a bit of a, a layer there, uh, which is about six inches depth, which does not, you know, it's a bit difficult to spade. So I thought I'd do an infiltration test on that, which basically means taking a bit of plastic you can buy in each DIY shop or uh, plumber shop, four inch drain pipe, push it down into the soil and fill it with water and see how much water will actually infiltrate over a period of time. So here are my two drain pipes, one in the subsoil, which is a good uh, 10 inches down and one at about six inches down. And what we found is, going, what we're really looking for is limiting compacted layers, uh, which again, in the AHDB healthy grassland soil guide, you can actually have the, uh, uh, the photographs and, and uh, assessment how to assess that. But that is actually looking at it. What I did with the uh, infiltration experiment is actually looking to see, see you know, whether we had a good soil structure to let water and air infiltrate, because where you put water, the air will also go, and soils, at the end of the day, need to breathe. So we're looking for a, a limited layer. Uh, this is after about three minutes. So in that one, six inches down, we saw about a centimeter of water go down. Uh, the one behind that we can see that dropped about three centimeters uh, what we don't actually want we don't want when we have a rainfall for water to flood out of our fields because it tends to fin finish up in villages and we've had plenty of incidences of floods in Cornwall uh, Boss Castle, Lou and Paul Perro in the last sort of uh, 10 years 10 to 15 years uh, we want to keep that water on our land this is a graph to actually say when we have and, and I think it's a bit relevant, actually, because if you look into the very rare falls, which is one in 100 years, if you look at a 10 minute graph, you know, down, down the bottom there, that's 10 minutes down there. If we have 33 millimeters of rainfall in 10 minutes, this is one in 100 year event. So for Adrian's sake, it's one in 100 year event. Actually came that his soils would not be able to sort of carry out that uh, rainfall event because we had dropped one centimeters in three minutes which is 33 millimeters in 10 minutes which is the one in 100 year event so technically when it rains Adrian at that level the one in 100 year event Adrian would actually flood and Adrian did say that field at times would actually flood the field below so we must have rainfall events which are more than 33 millimeters in 10 minutes happening but having said that this subsoil which is the uh, topsoil here because the top six inches of the soil actually would infiltrate 82.5 millimeters in 10 minutes which is well above a 1 in 100 year event and the subsoil would take the same as well so that would take well over three inches of rain in 10 minutes you know i doubt very much whether we have any of such rainfall events apart from an instant cloud burst uh, can right. i jump in with so, a couple of questions is that all right yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, how often should you dig a hole in each field? I think that's quite a good question. How often? Mm. Uh, it's actually quite good to dig at least six holes in the field to find out that you're not in the wrong place because sometimes you can stand in the gateway or an old track or uh, a fertilizer tram line or a slurry tanker tram line. That, you know, you pick up, you get the wrong idea. Uh, if ideally you should dig, dig a trench. You know, we've we've all been to demo. Well, a lot of us have been to demonstrations before, where literally we dug a trench about four to six foot deep, so you could actually literally stand in there, look across the whole soil profile, and look at damage caused by machinery, etc. Yeah, so you know, the the more the better, really, to have a better understanding of what's really happening. How would you do that? How 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 many years? So how often? So you you do that number? How many times should you do that? I think in each field you should do it at least like you do soil sampling once every five years and I also would definitely do it after I had a definitely after 
we had a wet autumn last year, 2019, uh, for, and we had a prolonged rain period into well into the spring this year, and then all of a sudden turned dry. If we have some unusual weather patterns and we had stock out at the wrong time, I would definitely do it after a period where I, we knew that the soil would be very much stressed, either waterlogged. So yeah, it's not it's not a timing thing. It's more a it is a timing thing rather than how many times in a year or whatever. It's it's definitely timing after an event okay, to look what's great. happened to the soil. Thank you. And someone's asked, um, Adrian, this will be for you. How long does it take you to measure all your fields? I'm assuming that's for grass growth as opposed to how big they are. Yeah, I mean, there's about 52 fields in total, I think. And of those, I think I measure about 40 odd. And it takes me roughly about three hours. Okay. Which, and that's, that's going as fast as I can. You know, I don't actually walk them physically. I've got a Polaris range where I sit in that one and stop every 10 yards and take a plate meeting without even getting out. Okay, and how often do you do that, just out of interest in keeping with the previous question? Um, ideally, it should be every week. Um, back in the spring, uh, when lockdown started, we had we got a farm shop on site as well, and the plan was my wife was going to do it. And with the farm shop and the kids being home, her time disappeared, and I didn't have time to do it. So we, I think we missed six weeks period in the early spring, and then we were fairly good during the middle of summer, and then. It's gone a bit wayward in September, but ideally, I think every one once a week during the growing season, and then back. Well, back now, stop in it, Lapo. Okay, thank you. Yeah, stop now because grass is not really growing that much. Uh, I would also say to make it easier on yourself, do not grow. Do, when we had that drought early on in in May June, when it wasn't growing very much, uh, don't don't bother doing it weekly. Then only do it when grass starts growing again, as long as you still stay within that. Uh, um, grazing rotation, uh, do it once in that grazing rotation. So uh, you can actually you know, make life difficult for yourself by measuring it versus not growing, which is this time of the year. I, nowadays, most of my farmers are on hold until about February time. Are we all right? Yeah, sorry, when I take my video off, that means I'm not going to say anything. So, <laughs> yeah, keep going. I'm just sorry. conscious I'm... Yeah, I, thought, I thought the internet went. <laughs> so, okay, uh, this is in what I would describe as probably my ultimate healthy soil. Uh, it's That's a spade depth worth, so that's 20 centimetres, 8 inches worth of soil, which is all nice and crumbly all the way through the profile. Uh, that, that sort of big rooty type thing at the top, that's actually white clover root, uh, and then some... Uh, uh, some creeping uh, buttercup in there as well, but there's actually a massive big earthworm there as well, which actually is the you know, sort of biology that actually you know improves soils uh, and 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 improves drainage and aeration without having to rely on steel too much. When you, the diagrammatic reason for soil the way it should be is actually 50% of soil, 25% water, and 25 uh, air, so everything can breathe in the soil but that is really like sand you know there's nothing in there to hold the water back so what we're looking for in soils to actually retain water we're looking at organic matter to hold water back it's a bit like filling up a fire basket with water with uh, uh, compost you know that is organic matter that holds water back if you fill it up with sand whatever water you pour in the top will drain out the bottom so the water that we infiltrate in the soil which I showed before that goes into the soil should stay there to actually feed the bacteria and feed, help the roots to take up nutrients. So organic matter is very good at that. And it's only recently that we really started looking at soil organic matter in, in, in a more de detailed way. Uh, we've been quite lucky in Cornwall where we have uh, quite a bit of funding uh, through Cornwall Agritech to look at soil organic matter levels and uh, also soil health as well. Uh, here we have a, a, an output from the Soil Carbon Project looking at uh, Soil particles with the VES top and the VES bottom. Uh, the lower the, the the score, the more crumbly, more surface area that the, the soil has. Uh, so horticulture, where you're actually power harrowing the fields and making very fine seed bed, you have a very low score. Uh, the permanent pasture at 2.26. You know, it's fairly high score because you will have some compaction in the top layer. 
uh, and arable, again, because of cultivation practices, you have a lower score. Uh, you can see the infiltration level there as well, horticulture as well, because you actually have a very fine soil. You know, that, that's actually quite a rapid infiltration there, whereas arable, probably because of compaction somewhere along the line, and also grassland at four is a bit more. Uh, earthworms in the pit, you know, it's 4.8, so project average, but that's ranging from 10.8 in arable to 2.8 in horticulture, with permanent grassland being around, and grassland itself being around about four. Uh, then you've got other things like aggregate stability. If you ever put a bit of soil in water, it's quite a good party trick uh, from land that you ploughed up about a fortnight ago to land that's still growing a crop. But where there is organic matter and there's life, the soil will actually stick together. Once you actually have land that's been disturbed and, it's, and there's nothing growing on it, you'll find that the aggregate stability is actually reduced. So you can see in permanent pasture here, the aggregate stability, because it's alive, the pasture as well, the life is 0.18, but as soon as you go into arable, where there's a lot of disturbance of ground, by I said, by ploughing, power harrowing, all the mechanical interventions, that soil will actually slake out very quickly over a period of about five minutes. Okay, so going back to organic matter, okay, the reason why grassland does well in holding back water is because it's higher in organic matter. We can see here that the grassland average is about 9.87% in the 0 to 10 centimetre layer, whereas arable is only 0.729. Permanent grassland is even that much higher, so arable is nearly half of what permanent grassland is, and that goes right throughout the whole depth up to half a metre. And th this is the bit of research, so apart from that bit of research through Cornwall Agritech, which is a soil carbon project at Dutchie College, we also have Northwick Research as well doing an experiment at all uh, on uh, set stock versus rotational grazing. So here you see uh, Hereford crosses and flat fee crosses on the set stock paddock, and here we have it behind the fence in the rotational graze paddock. And this has now been three years worth of data, and it shows, okay, in the set stocking, you might say, okay, we have higher output per animal here, and 2018 is half a kilo a day, 2019.8, and 2020, one kilo a day growth rates on animal. On the rotational grazing, paddock grazing system, is 0 0.32, 0 0.59, and 0.76. So on average, about a 30% decrease in growth rates, but that's per animal. But because we're making better use of grass growth, because we're actually allowing the grass, grasses to recover. Because you can imagine an animal, when it goes back into a field, the first thing we look at is what's the most palatable. And your most palatable bit of grass that you find is that first leaf, especially with sheep that are selective grazers. They will select out that newly regrown leaf, which means that your productive grasses over time will actually diminish. And that's probably one of the re biggest reasons on Adrian's farm, because he has sheep grazing as well as beef, why over period of five or six years that the swords deteriorate so quickly. So if we can go in and if we then look at the total output per hectare of kilos of live weight produced per hectare, we're actually seeing on average about 50% increase in productivity over the years by going rotational grazing versus set stocking. So it's very important to bear that in mind is that rotational grazing actually increases output per hectare, not necessarily per animal. Interesting thing as well that's come up in that study, uh, the first year study when it showed up a slight difference in soil organic matter between the blue graph being the set stock graph and the orange graph being the rotational grade graph is that there's a slight difference in soil organic matter, but as time has gone on, the soil organic matter difference has actually increases. So we're actually seeing as an increase, which is all building resilience within the system because the more soil organic matter we have, the more we're able to hang on to moisture, the more we're able to weather a, a period of drought, but also at the same time, organic matter as well will actually help to improve drainage because it provides a food source for worms. So therefore, earthworms being there, it will actually help to improve drainage. So it does both things. So in conclusion then, for quality grass production, we need healthy soils, and not heathy soils, sorry about my writing, I'm Dutch. Uh, high in organic matter, hold water, have adequate drainage and can breathe, so therefore they're alive. 
Uh, we have to provide periodic rest to paddocks, allowing soils and grass to recover. So that's why, why rotational grazing is so beneficial. Graze in good conditions. Uh, this is a must, really, because when the soils are wet, especially on heavy clays, we don't want to start compacting the soils because then you imagine the soil being compacted, the animals that live there underneath the earthworms can't breathe. So, and also we need to graze when the temperatures are rising over six degrees, so grass is growing. Uh, and all, ideally between at the three least stage, which if you do plate meter is between 2,700 and 3,300 kilos per hectare on the mainly grass type sward, then ultimately high quality forage you know, should give ultimate stock performance. So thanks so much, we'll take questions. Thank you, Lapo. Are there any questions from the audience now, Yes, there are. Okay. Um, at one point, there wasn't many coming in, and I'm struggling to keep on top of them, which is great. Can you describe the best conditions to use sward lifter to fix compaction? Yeah, uh, uh, on the sward lifter, because you're actually going in at depth, um, I would actually, you know, get my spade out and dig down, see where the compaction is. Like in Adrian's example, because I identified that layer at about six inches, so I didn't actually explain that six inches was actually a plough pound because that field was in an arable crop before that. Um, and it ha so now knowing where the compaction is, finding out how deep the compaction is, and going one or two inches below that. So if that compaction was two inch at six inches depth, it started, and it was about an inch deep because of the plough pan, I would actually go a depth of about nine inches below soil surface to, to do that. And I would do that in the autumn when the soil is still crumbly, so it breaks up, so it doesn't smear. I think now, this time in October, because you had a fair bit of rain, it probably most, well, like my spade showed, it's actually too wet, sticky, and it will smear. It has to break up. So the time to do it is usually around about mid, mid September onwards to early October. Okay. Would you recommend the use of subsoilers to alleviate compaction? Uh, it actually goes back to the sword lifter. It's exactly the same thing, sword lifters. So I, I would actually favour lifters and subsoilers at the right time of the year in the autumn. Uh, I've had one or two occasions where farmers use them in the spring because after last autumn, when we knew we had compacted soils because animals left out late, they thought they did it in the spring. This year has been absolute disaster on some of them because when you lift the soils up in the spring, the soils turn really dry. Well, firstly, you're allowing more infil uh, quicker water infiltration, but your soils are dry quicker and you're broken off the roots. So there's not much, and yeah, so we, we've seen some yellow stripes in fields. So I, I would actually recommend doing it going into the autumn when the soils get wetter. Okay. Um, what do you use for um, measuring your grass, Adrian? What particular piece of kit? Um, I've got a plate meter, which um, actually links to my um, Android phone that actually records it directly onto the phone. Then I can okay. link it to the um, Agrinet. Okay. Probably worth highlighting there that if you want to get started with measuring your grass, we can offer sward sticks from AHDB. It's um it's a little measure that we can send out to you um, and it gives you um oh there's a plate meter and there's a sward stick. Thank you. <laughs> Our lovely assistants there. Um so we've got a question through which um are trailed pasture meters as accurate as a plate meter? Uh, only if one. calibrated correctly. So, sorry, uh, if, if there's anything, now even, it's the same with uh, remote sensing with satellite measurements. Uh, in, you, can, you can get figures from anything really to measure height. Uh, people, you know, people try welly boot uh, tapes around welly boots and also the trail pasture meters as well. The best thing to do to actually, I would go in, confirm it in the field, but actually taking a a cut at about 40, centi 40, 40 millimetres, four, four centimetres or five centimetres height and actually weigh it and put it in the microwave and get a dry matter figure reading to make sure that it's actually on par with what you find in the field and you have to take a sample of that several places through the field but it has to be calibrated correctly. Okay, um, Lupo, you stated a 20% organic matter target by volume, but grass soil are generally less than 10. Does your figure include roots or any other biomass? 
Okay, it's it's it was a diagrammatic representation of what Shaw Soul should be. I'm not saying that should be the target, but it'd be nice to have it as a target. If anybody gets to twenty percent, please let me know, and I increase my target to thirty. <laughs> so, would you say it is near a ten, Lupo? That that figure, or do you think it's less? No, we we've seen it from the the the, the, uh, uh, the I'll go back. You know to that slide you know we see that the levels are around about 10 percent you know they were actually down to about eight eight and a half eight so yeah it, it's 10 percent is a nice one to work with we can actually increase it for any stage no, i haven't seen any at 20 on grassland probably with the 1400 source samples done at dutchy college that might have saved one at 20 percent but once you get above that you get into peaty soils on dartmoor ah okay um, am I all right to keep going with questions, guys? Is there any more? Con no, yep, yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, is it advisable to stop grazing cattle and um, perhaps um, house them once temperatures are below six degrees? We take ours indoors once the soil is too wet and have never really considered it's ever too cold to continue grazing. Sorry, the temperature actually six degrees relates to grass growth. It doesn't, it's not, it's not a, a measure to for housing cattle if your soil can if you had a farm that is that is dry enough to keep cattle out all year round then it's not a problem but if your soil conditions are you know cows start poaching and 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 start what i say putting mud onto grass so they actually reject the grass because they've trodden over it and and dirty it then it's i would say it's time to actually house them so the temperature itself is not a, not a, it's just a measure on when grass starts growing and I prefer when grass for cows to start eating when grass starts growing not to do with soil conditions okay well hopefully that answers, answers the question yeah it does brilliant um if you can't use a sword lifter now what about a spiked aerator uh, same thing again because that was Adrian's point to me he wanted to aerate that field with an aerator uh, which is actually a spike uh, machine that will go to five to six inches of depth which will take care of surface compaction uh, in Adrian's field actually with that example we had no issue with surface compaction if anything it was slightly beyond, beyond that six inch depth but if you put a spade in the ground before you start using a sword lifter before you go into the field and, and you smear the spade do not go in there with a sword lifter because the only thing you do is smear the soil so yeah i think you're probably fine when you can't go with the uh, uh, uh subsoil you probably can't go with the sword lifter either because it's too wet okay thank you um and this is one about the sort of three leaf phase i don't know if that noise is mine um if grass on a field is long and post three leaf phase now as we go into the winter and we've got to bring the cattle off the land how would you manage this between now and spring so if you have three leaf stage already there and you can't manage it to graze it all by now yeah they've got to bring question? them in yeah 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 and because we had that you know going back to that grass growth gra graph because we had a, that rapid grass growth at the end of september into october and then it all of a sudden got cold and wet a lot of cattle had to be housed with still a lot of grass out there in the three leaf stage um ideally um i had that discussion yesterday with my grazing group we ideally we actually go and uh, graze that off with sheep um you know because sheep would actually take good care of that because if it's over wintered especially in our part of the world with high rainfall the only thing will do it rots and if you make it, if that's a silage field you may have bad, bad silage for next year if it's still left at the beginning of next year you know then i would say graze it as early as you can if soil conditions are allowed to graze out on the first grazing round to uh, basically finish up with the clean clean sward again so either very early grazing next year to graze it out or you know have sheep in very early on in the winter okay thank you um based on my timings are we gonna oh have we run out of time leah did you um, want to just you probably close? got another couple of minutes if, if there's more questions you can have two minutes yeah okay so aerator would make holes in top layers well now in soft soil so if compaction there would not be better trying to fix now than leave another year if the soil, like i said again take a spade out if the if a spade comes you put it in the soil and it comes out dry then use an aerator okay but 
if it smears, don't don't use the aerator. Yeah. So you could probably, even though it would be leaving it for another year, you'd probably do more damage now than good if you were to do it in those conditions. Well, you smear you smear in the soil, which means that you're not actually, you know, you're not cracking the soil up. It, it's like putting a knife in butter and taking it out again. You know, you're not helping infiltration in that hole at all. The water, if anything, you probably might create on on heavy clay soils. You might create a hole there for water to stand in. Okay. Uh, and and not will actually prevent the soil from drying out first thing in the spring. So uh, I would I would actually probably leave it until the you know the conditions are right in the spring with an aerator uh, to to aerate it then. Okay. Sorry, I know I think I've asked you the same question in several different ways, but you can tell the level of my kit knowledge here, asking the different sorts of um, questions. Is now the best time to start thinking about rotational grazing for next year? Thinking about having that wedge in front of you for spring? Yes, I can explain. Um, the uh, <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> the um, yeah, it's actually if it, it, a lot of time you can okay. Just to put it bluntly, if you want to make money and want to make money in grass, grass is twice as important to you in the spring as it is in the autumn. A lot of people think that extended grazing or, or making the best use of grass is actually grazing up till Christmas. Uh, if Aiden wants to graze a field by so sort of mid-February next year, he needs to lay that field up as of now, mid-November, uh, mid-October, sorry. So to give that grass a rest, that 120-day rest before we start grazing again. So it's so important to start thinking about if you have, a, and I usually, I would select the driest field to be laid up now to be able to be grazed it as of next February onwards. So yeah, now is the time to start thinking about it, not next February. Yeah, okay. And then if I just see one last one in, um, this is going back to almost at the beginning, we're talking about species on the farm. Why limit yourselves to so few species? Would greater diversity um, be required both in species, but also for rooting depth? Yeah, I can understand that question fully well because we've done a lot of, uh, another part of the research with Cornwall Agritech has been to herbal lace, uh, and it's actually interesting where, and and, uh, and previously it was commented on, on chicory and plantain, if they were classified as grasses as, as well, but we, we've found out that with herbal lace, we're having the same production capacity with herbal lace, up to about 10 tonne of dry matter per hectare for the year, compared to 150 kilos of nitrogen rye grasses and the one thing with the herbal lace as well they're providing us with uh, greater resilience in the system as in being able to actually skip through a drought if, if the drought is short enough so uh, you know when i'm not saying rye grass is the one that's just used as an example but in herbal lace we have plenty of rooting depth uh, i've had farmers with roots of chicory down to three foot so um, yeah, we're not limiting ourselves just to the top four four inches of soil, but we go deeper than that. Okay, right. In just of time. Okay, I'll hand over. Leah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I just have one final slide before uh, we pull it to a close. Um, so just to say, there are lots of resources available to you at AHDB. Um, if you go onto our website and look under our knowledge library, um, some that are relevant today are the Healthy Grass and Soils Assessment, the Principles of Soil Management, and How to Count Your Earthworms. Um, there's also a webinar you can check out on YouTube called Grass and Soils, Knowing What You've Got and How to Improve It. And we mentioned our sword sticks as well. So if you want to get your hand on, on a sword stick, then please just get in touch with someone at AHDB, lovely modeled there by Lupo, um, and we'll send one of those out to you. Um, if you're just getting started with measuring your grass, um, that, that's a nice inexpensive way of getting the hang of it before um, forking out for a plate, plate meter. So thank you ever so much for your time today. Thanks for dialing in and a massive thank you to our speakers today, Adrian Coombe, our Cornwall Strategic Farmer, Lupo Diefenbrook, our Independent Grass and Consultant, and my colleague, Nerith. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.